Facing Systemic Racism Committee in collaboration with the Faith Formation Board. 58 years ago, imprisoned in solitary confinement for participating in a nonviolent protest on behalf of the marginalized of Birmingham, Alabama, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. penned a rebuttal letter addressed to eight white Alabama clergymen who criticized him for his involvement in those protests. Today, we wish to present the historical, social, and theological context of Dr. King's prophetic letter. This is the first in a series of presentations that will continue through the Lenten season to discuss the question of whether the objections raised by these white Christian clergymen to the peaceful demonstration of the 60s mirrors the attacks being leveled today by white conservatives upon those who seek reforms in many of the most pressing social justice issues of our times. We seek to discuss a letter from a Birmingham jail, not only in commemoration of Dr. King's birthday, but because this historically significant document compels us to ask whether Dr. King's statements on the dangers of complacency and the need for vigilance in the never ending fight for biblical righteousness and justice are as relevant now as they were in 1963. We are fortunate to have with us today our senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Randy Bush, who possesses expert knowledge on the historical context and circumstances which informed the words and actions of Dr. King during the spring of 1963. It was part of his doctoral dissertation. So we're thrilled to have that. We are also thrilled, I hope, to have with us Eddie Wilson, who will be the moderator for today, who will also welcome us. Eddie, of course, is a member here and proud and good standing as an elder and previous deacon, I believe, as far as ELPC. He is also the chair of the Pittsburgh Presbyterian Church uh, International Mission work. Yes, okay. ma'am. Eddie there. Can folks in the, in the sanctuary hear me or in, in journeys? Okay, I can hear, kind of hear him. Okay, if I need to be louder, I can be louder. Is no, that helpful? We're fine. We just have to get the connection in the church, Eddie. So go uh, ahead. All right. Well, again, thank you so much, Ms. Lenore. Thank you to everyone in the church. As Ms. Lenore said, my name is Eddie Wilson, and I am honored to be the moderator this morning. And welcome to everyone on Zoom and in the fellowship hall for this great conversation, this introduction to a three-part series on a letter from a Birmingham jail. Um, as a reminder from Ms. Lenore, uh, as Lenore said, uh, we will be recording, so anybody that would like to, to turn their video off um, should do so. And we are, uh, I, uh, sorry, I'm getting a message. Oh, look, there's my video. Sorry, I couldn't turn it on earlier. Hey, everybody. <laughs> um, thank you for being here. If you would like to not be on the recording, please make sure your video is off. Um, we are happy to get started, and without further ado, let me open us in prayer. Gracious God, we come to you through the challenges of technology, and we come to you through the challenges of COVID and the challenges of racism, both systemic and individualistic. Heavenly Father, we are blessed that you give us this space to discuss the letter from Reverend Dr. King, Reverend Dr. King. We are blessed that you give us Reverend Dr. Randy Bush to lead this conversation. And gracious God, we are so grateful for the opportunity to be in fellowship with one another, both in our homes and in our church. Thank you for this time. Please bless the time to your word and to your works. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned before, today's session is the first of a three-part series. It is intended to be an introduction to the letter from a Birmingham jail from Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And we will have two additional hybrid sessions, just like this one, where the technology will be less challenging on March 13th and April 9th to actually consider the content of the letter and the responses. The public statements by the local pastors, which Lenore um, mentioned before, that led to Dr. King's letter, his response, and the details for those sessions will be available very soon on the church website, as well as through our social media outlets, 
outlets and through a churchwide uh, mailing. Following uh, Pastor Randy's presentation today, we'll all be able to gather in small discussion groups on Zoom. My amazing, wonderful wife will put us in breakout groups and in the fellowship hall, you'll be able to uh, separate and converse with one another. And we'll have short discussions that'll be fluid for no more than 15 minutes. Uh, if for folks that are on Zoom during that time, obviously you should unmute yourselves to be able to participate in the conversation. And now without further ado, it's my pleasure and my honor to introduce my pastor, Reverend Dr. Randy Bush. He is a trustee for Westminster College in New Wilmington, Pennsylvania. He is the winner of the 2017 Hosanna Preaching Prize. He is the recipient of the Faith in Action Award by the NAACP Pittsburgh Unit in 2014. And he is completing his 16th year of ministry here at East Liberty Presbyterian Church. A major part of his doctoral dissertation, as Lenore said, was focusing on the nature of contemporary prophetic figures like Dr. King, Mahatma Gandhi, Rosa Parks, and Henry David Thoreau. And he believes that the value of studying King's letter today is that it has so many of the themes that Dr. King addressed are also relevant today and sadly unresolved even in 2022. So please welcome my pastor, Reverend Dr. Randy Bush. Good morning, all. Thank you for your patience and for those that are watching on Zoom. All right, so we're going to talk about this essay, but we're going to talk about the pivotal role that it has played in the civil rights movement. And I want to remind her that there's links to the essay itself and to the letter from the clergyman that precipitated it through our website. So it's a pivotal document. We're going to jump right into it in that it has a prophetic voice calling for change, calling for change through civil disobedience and for people of faith to stop delaying acts of justice. Because as King himself said, the time to do what is right is always right. And there's even been consideration in the course of our Presbyterian church uh, politics to include the letter from the Birmingham jail within the book of confessions of our denomination. So initially the facing systemic racism and the faith formation groups thought we would simply talk about the letter today. But in more conversation, it was clear that we needed to take a step back and know more about the context out of which the letter emerged 59, almost 59 years ago. And so we're gonna spend some time looking at the obstacles that King faced and overcame and the setting out of which the letter arose. So let's go to that. In March, 1963, it's important to remember that Martin Luther King was only 34 years old. He was a young husband. He was a young father. His public career, though, had started about eight years earlier, when in 1955, Rosa Parks refused to surrender her seat on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. And King, as a new pastor in the community, was chosen to lead the citywide protest that would then be a year-long bus boycott pushing for ending segregation on public transportation. So 1955 to King must have seemed like a hundred years before, given the amount of traveling and public speaking he'd endured, as well as the harassment and the threats against himself and his family, and at least a dozen times spent behind bar in prison. So the letter from the Birmingham jail, we start there with the question, why is King in jail for the 13th time? In the 1960s, Birmingham, Alabama was the largest city in the state. It had a population of about 350,000 or more, and about 40% 40 of that population were African Americans. But in spite of that large presence of African American citizens, it was one of the most persistent and intransigent citadels of racial segregation in the South. And so in 1963, Dr. King and the group that he worked with, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, decided that Birmingham, Alabama should be the place for their next campaign, their next public witness of sit-ins and marches to bring about change in the segregation policies. And the idea was, 
if they can make an impact in Birmingham, then they could probably have an impact that would ripple through to other places in the South. So April 3rd, 1963, King and the others started this civil rights campaign in Birmingham. And people did turn out. They did participate in the opening sit-ins and marches, but they didn't turn out in the numbers that King and his supporters had hoped for. Over the first really eight days of protests, only about 150 people were actually arrested. The previous campaign that they had done in Albany, Georgia, just the prior year, had over 300 people arrested on the very first day. So King knew that for this campaign to succeed, something else had to happen. And more than likely what it meant was he could no longer stand behind the scenes. He could no longer be a spokesperson. He had to literally get out in front of the campaign and participate in these activities. It was a risky decision, but he knew he couldn't stay on the sidelines any longer. Now, there are a lot of reasons why King was hesitant to march in Birmingham in 1963. So let me just mention a few of these in the time we have. Number one, the start of the campaign wasn't as strong as King had hoped. But even on top of that, all the newspapers, and in fact, all the national media, maligned King and the SCLC for even doing a campaign right then. They called it a poorly timed protest that would only flame up tensions just at the time when Birmingham looked to be on the cusp of making progress. See, what had happened is that a few months earlier, Birmingham had voted to change its form of local government before it had a commission, and now it was moving to something similar to Pittsburgh, to have a mayor and a city council. They knew that this transition to a different form of city government was the best chance to unseat a man named Theophilus Eugene Connor, also known as Bull Connor. And so the election was held in early March, March the 5th. And in that election, Connor did not win the position of being mayor of the city. And so King had delayed the start of the campaign till after the election. But the reality was the man that they did elect as mayor, a man named Albert Butwell, was not considered by King and his colleagues to be much better than Bull Connor. And so he decided to go ahead with the campaign anyway. Secondly, King and his team arrive in Birmingham. Now they're immediately obviously met by a lot of opposition from the white community and the white business community, but they also met with a significant amount of pushback from the African-American community, from the African-American business leaders and many of the African-American ministers. The reason was that they felt that it was wrong for a protest to take place that they weren't actively leading. And even more so, they felt it was difficult to do this protest in the week before Easter Sunday, which was a huge time for the businesses for shopping. And so there was pushback from the local community and local leadership. Why are these outsiders coming in and disrupting us before Easter? Third difficulty, and probably the most daunting, Knowing that King and his group were coming to Birmingham, the state of Alabama passed a special court injunction on April the 10th. So within the seven days after he's arrived, they passed an injunction that expressly forbade Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Ralph Abernathy from taking part in any public marches. And it was the first time in all of his work over those last eight years that he had been specifically named in a state injunction. And it would be if King marched the very first time that he would defy a legal rule, a law of the state. And so King was worried about the precedent that would set by defying the injunction. With that, remember this is 1963, they've been going for a while, SCLC was low on bail money. See, once you got arrested, if you wanted to get out, you had to pay the bail, and because there was a practice of trying to stop these, they kept raising the bail in all these communities. And so the organization was low on bail money. King wasn't sure that if he marched and got arrested, he would even have a chance to get out of prison anytime soon. Fourth, there were a whole slew of personal barriers that made it a difficult choice for King to decide to march. Number one, 
Coretta Scott King had just given birth one week earlier to his fourth child, Bernice. He had hardly even seen his wife. He'd been back and, and Montgomery had seen her and driven her home from the hospital and then he'd left immediately to plan this campaign. And so his wife's alone at home with the new fourth child and he's there in Birmingham. The other detail is that as he's thinking about this, he's meeting in a suite of rooms at the Gaston Motel in Birmingham. And he's meeting with all of his closest advisors, including his father. And every single one of them, including his father, said you shouldn't march. That they weren't sure it was the right time, that if he got arrested, there was no one to speak publicly, there was no one to travel to raise funds, and it would put him at, at an extreme level of risk in this city to be put in jail. So King, in his book, Why We Can't Wait, described what happened next. In that suite of rooms, he went to the back room where he could be alone, and he closed the door, and he stood there, and this is what he said about it. He said, in that moment, I thought of the Birmingham Negro community waiting. I thought of 20 million black people who dreamed that someday they might be able to cross the Red Sea of injustice and find their way to the promised land of integration and freedom. And I realized there was no more room for doubt that he had to act. And so he opens up the door, he emerges to the room, and he basically tells the advisors and the people there, I don't know what will happen, I don't know where the money will come from, but I have to make a faith act. So, we're now on April 12th, 1963. April 12, 1963, was Good Friday, 1963. King, as was his practice before he took places in marches, anticipating going to jail, changed into work clothes out of his suit. He then left the motel and went with about 40 people to the 16th Street Baptist Church for an opening rally, and then to begin to march from that place to a large public park. Now, a side note. 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, five months later, would be tragically bombed, and there would be four young African-American girls killed in that act. The city of Birmingham, because of those types of acts of violence, was known as Bombingham. Anyway, King and the group march out from the church. They don't get very far before the police swoop in from both sides and quickly arrest King and Abernathy. And because they were arrested, it provoked the crowd so that more people joined the march. And eventually, before the day was done, about 52 people ended up in the Birmingham jail. Now, all the other times King had been arrested, he and Ralph Abernathy were put in the same cell. That allowed them to support one another, talk with one another, but also just to keep working, to keep planning and making preparations for whatever came next. This time, though, for the first time, King was put in solitary confinement. He was put in a single cell with a metal cot, no mattress, no pillow, no blanket. A man of faith, a minister of God, in an empty cell on Good Friday. Now, as fate and providence would have it, on that very same day in Birmingham, Alabama, eight prominent local religious leaders were going to gather for lunch in one of the nicer hotels. And they were going to consider a draft statement that they were going to release and then have published in the Birmingham News, the local paper. This group included a Catholic bishop, two Methodist bishops, two Episcopal bishops, a Baptist minister, a Presbyterian minister, and a Jewish rabbi. Now, this group of eight clergy were not segregationists. Literally, in January of that same year, they had also published a statement speaking out against Governor Wallace when he made his declaration of segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. This was the group of people who often had tried to move the discussion forward. However, in their statement on that Good Friday, they argued that racial injustice should be handled in the courts, not in the streets. And they argued that people should be persuaded to do what is right and not guided by outsiders to these public acts. So back to King. King is alone in his jail for Good Friday, 
and for Holy Saturday. He finally, we think, received his first visitors on Easter Sunday. Sometime on that day, two lawyers were able to get to him. It was during this time, too, they began negotiating for him to call his wife. They even had to work through President Kennedy to get that call put through for his own benefit. It's likely is that these two lawyers, when they arrive in that cell, brought a copy of the Saturday Birmingham News that contained the editorial from the clergy group. Now, this had to be frustrating to King. These religious leaders who did this statement were the very people King had hoped would be the first to support him in his efforts for change in Birmingham. As I said, these were the more liberal clergy in the area. They had already made space in their worship services for people of color to join together. So King reads the statement, and he immediately begins to draft a response to the clergy. And having no other paper at hand, what he does is literally write in the margins of that same newspaper. I want to read just his first paragraph of what he said to them. He said, my dear fellow clergymen, while confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling my present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. Now here's kind of his humor and digs in there. If I sought to answer all the criticisms that cross my desk, my secretaries would have little time for anything other than such correspondence in the course of the day, and I would have no time for constructive work. But since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and that your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I want to try and answer your statements in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. So King begins writing in the margins of the paper that he had there. We think that on the next day, on Monday, a different lawyer visited him, and King was able to give him the initial draft, or at least part of it, on the paper that was smuggled out. And over the course of the next several days, that's how the whole letter was written, scribbled on spare bits of paper, given to visitors that came to King, and then whisked out of the jail where secretaries or volunteers would decode his handwriting and type it up and prepare a manuscript. On April 20th, so eight days later, King is finally able to leave jail when they can post bail for him. But the letter that he wrote and had completed by this point was not immediately published in Birmingham, nor was it directly sent back to the eight clergy. It took about another month before the letter was compiled and, and polished to the point where it could be published even either in excerpts or in complete form in the New York Post, the New York Times, and in a magazine of that day called Christianity in Crisis. Now, it may be easy for us from our perspective here to think that the letter from Birmingham jail empowered then the campaign of Birmingham, but actually the reverse is true. Taylor Branch is probably the main historian of the civil rights era, and he wrote this. He said, it was because of unexpected miracles from the Birmingham movement that King's letter from the Birmingham jail was transformed from a silent cry of desperation to a famous pronouncement of moral triumph. So here's what happened. When King was released from the jail, he's able to meet with his advisors again and plan what their next step should be in this larger campaign in the city. For the very first time, under pressure from the student groups, King allowed children and students to march in the protests. They'd never before been allowed to be a part in participants for very obvious reasons. This was a dangerous and yet a pivotal decision. Putting minors at risk was denounced quickly from many corners when it happened, but it was a key part in getting the world to understand the importance of the civil rights movement and the brutality that was present in the segregationist cities. So as you all know and remember, Bull Connor's main tactic when a peaceful march came down the street was to respond with fire hoses and with police dogs. When the world witnessed literally this type of violence being unleashed against peaceful protesters, marchers, who included men, but also women and students and children, those images changed the tone of the entire civil rights movement. And then 
as they sought to understand why people would put themselves in harm's way, it's the vocabulary of King's letter that helps people understand what they were fighting for and why this nonviolent approach was the model they were choosing. King was asked to explain how the letter from Birmingham jail then affected the civil rights movement going forward. And he answered that in one of his most famous interviews, which was in Playboy magazine in 1965. And King actually said this. He said, there are two or three important things that can be partially attributed to the letter from Birmingham jail. He said, by now, this is 1965, more than a million copies of this letter have been distributed in churches and houses of worship across the country. It has focused even greater attention upon what is happening in Birmingham. And I am sure that without what happened in Birmingham, there would not have been a march on Washington. And the images from Birmingham, to a great extent, brought the civil rights bill to finally be passed in 1963, because Birmingham caused President Kennedy to reorder his priorities with Congress. So I'm gonna close now with two thoughts, and then you're gonna be in some small groups that hopefully you can discuss some more and build a foundation that will carry over to the next presentations. First one, Martin Luther King wrote his letter as a way to express disappointment over the lack of support from people he felt should have been his allies. He overcame many adversities and obstacles in deciding to march, and then he kept pushing forward for integration. He used a combination of his written words and spoken words and his literal actions, the marches, to get his message across. So the question is, how can we also be inspired to combine our words and our actions to bring about progress on anti-racism? And then secondly, change when it occurs is not necessarily dependent on a dramatic event. A chance editorial and then a quick written response in the margins of a newspaper. One woman, after working her shift chooses not to move out of her seat in Montgomery. A young woman who's known sexual abuse finally decides to break the silence and adds to the voices under the hashtag Me Too. It doesn't always take a huge event to bring about dramatic change. So can we trust that God is near to us in the mundane moments of our daily life? And can we believe that every one of those moments, even the most typical, quotidian, and unassuming, because God is there, offers the chance for real change, offers a place for lasting hope, offers a way for us to bend the moral arc of the universe towards justice once more. So I thank you for your attention. I'm going to turn it back to Eddie and to Jen and for a small group discussion. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Pastor Randy. That's, that's really powerful and meaningful. We're now going to split up into breakout groups. Uh, if you're on Zoom, the amazing Jen Heights Wilson will split you automatically. Just join the, the room that she assigns you. If you're in the fellowship hall, um, then you'll, you'll have a chance for some small group conversation. I'm not sure how many folks you have. So uh, either one large group or several smaller groups. I'm sure uh, Ms. Lenore will lead that. And uh, we'll come back at about 1040, like I said, six to seven minutes and uh, rejoin then. Thank you. But I know that in my Oh, we're also recording. I don't know about the rest of you, but I know that in my breakout room, we barely touched the tip of the iceberg and my conversation left me hungry for more. We had just really great conversations about how do we get more than uh, 73 people into this conversation and how do we incorporate the thousands upon thousands of people in Pittsburgh and the ways that Dr. King and Rosa Parks did that and how do we seek out adversity while also continuing to inspire and motivate each other 
so that we can we can continue the movement. Um, so that that made me hungry for the next two sessions. Hopefully you are also hungry for the next two sessions. As a reminder, those sessions will be on March 13th and April 9th. We are excited to continue this conversation and really dig into the content of Dr. King's letter and continue some of these small group conversations. I wanna thank especially uh, everyone that stayed in the, in the church. I wanna thank all of the volunteers that made this happen. There is a, a team of about 15 people um, volunteering from the church to be facilitators and planners and leaders. Um, and so thank you to them. Thank you to Ms. Lenore for opening us up and for, for getting us all ready for this. Thank you for Paul to, for being our host and thank you to the entire team. We really, really appreciate all that you do. And I ask everyone to please come back on March 13th. Please come back April 9th and invite your friends. They can come via Zoom or they can be in person. And we're gonna continue this great conversation. And I ask that you please join me in a closing prayer. Gracious God, we are grateful. We are grateful for the Reverend Dr. King. We are grateful for Rosa Parks. We are grateful for the continuation of the movement. Heavenly Father, we know that there are injustices and inequities out there now that existed in 1963. And we know that it is your will that we fight against those injustices. And it is your will that we sometimes seek out the challenge, Lord. Heavenly Father, please help us to, to discern your will. Help us to know where we fit best. Help us to continue to have these conversations and help us to bring others into the conversation that, that might just be ignorant of the, the effect that they can have. Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all the wonderful people, both in the church and on Zoom. Please go with us the rest of this week and help your name to be on our lips and your word to be in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, everyone. I'm gonna say one more time, March 13th and April 9th, come back. Thank you all for being here. We really appreciate it. Have a wonderful Sunday.